Hello, my name is Champshi Gimbap and I am the political fish. Um, and I have been joined by Will Slater. Say hello, introduce yourself. Hello, my name's Will. I live in Madrid, which is very relevant to the book we're discussing today. Indeed. And obviously uh, a regular on the show seems to be Mr. Uh, Matthew Cooper. Hi, I'm here. I have not read the book. Uh, I'm here just out of interest and uh, also to ask Will. A Make up the numbers, about... mate. Well, that and also to ask Will a few <laughs> questions about how it relates to current Spanish politics and all that sort of it, because I'm sure there'll be yes, some, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. some bits and pieces that um, will, will parallel current events. Good, good, good. So um, while we're waiting for the magic number, um, can you tell us what you... Got... <laughs> I know, I know. I, I, I get like really worded out if it's not uh, 10 people watching before I um, get into the, the, the meat and the potatoes of the discussion. But anyway, um, so what are you reading at the moment? Uh, Will, you go first. What are you reading at the moment? At the moment, I'm reading a book called Caliban and the Witch by Silvia Federici. It's a book that details primitive accumulation during the transition from feudalism to capitalism in medieval Europe. Uh, kind of a lot wow. of um, peasant struggles that came before that and how the witch hunts that followed. This book kind of posits that um, not just down to religious superstition, a lot of it was done very deliberately to break class solidarity between women and men at that time. Ooh, interesting. Um, yeah, that sounds... Uh... Not very light. <laughs> oh, it's a grim read. It? It? it is such a grim read. Um, the illustrations yeah. are great, though, I must say. They've got these great engravings from the time. Uh, they've got, oh, got one of the Fall of Man, so a, an angel chasing Adam and Eve out the Garden of Eden. Uh, but the angel kind of looked like some nasty schoolmaster saying, Go on, you two. You know you've done wrong. Get out. And Adam and Eve are both there, naked, looking sexy, just like, well, What have we done? So. Well, that at least makes it so slightly light to read. Uh, I'm dull. I've not been uh... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, uh, Dysthymia says, today's witch hunters are the paedophile hunter groups. Um, well, if, if you just caught what uh, Will was just saying, apparently not. Um, so, <laughs> But I, I, I do understand your, um, your logic in that one. Um, so, yeah, what about you? Uh, uh, unfortunately, you I've been... A really bad person lately and i haven't been reading much because i've been so absorbed in sort of day-to-day -day what's going on and also i've had a mm. few sort of bits and pieces going on uh at home that i've not really been immersing myself in any books lately um but yeah. i am going to get back on that train pretty soon mm. Mm. So, have you got anything I lined up to report I, I have a book uh, that what... you, uh you recommended to me which <laughs> well you, you sort of did it in a sort of read through this and see if you can get through it without vomiting kind of thing which is oh the, right yeah yeah it was the, one of the, the two economic books yeah, yeah the, the right wing economic book that you uh, recommended to me which I, I'm, I'm intrigued um mm. I, I just can't remember which I just can't remember which I one forget, it was I forget that myself game. at the moment I, I need to go back and I've got it saved on my PC upstairs but I'm on the phone at the moment all oh, right. Okay. Cool. 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 Uh, well, I'm just reaching the end of uh, Adults in the Room by Yanis Varoufakis, um, and I'll tell you what. Um, I was on the fence uh, before when it came to the Brexit vote. I, I, I just fucking just get out of that fucking shit show, man. Absolutely leave. Um, it's not really an economics book, a book as such, because a lot of his other books are are just on on economics and you know uh, dealing with capitalism, how we're going to get beyond capitalism and the problems with capitalism, the problems with Europe, how it can be reformed, that kind of thing. Uh, this is more of a, a, a day to day blow by blow his experience as finance minister of Greece. So literally dated, timed, that kind of shit. Um, and it's and it is that's fucking grim, mate. What he went through. Yeah. Honestly. I was just about to say that sounds it's, like another very cheerful read. Yeah. Uh yeah, it was um yeah, it's yeah, it's pretty it's pretty fucking grim. I forget um, the guy's but, name, but someone who I I was speaking to a friend of mine about that actually about that book mm. uh, earlier this week and he was telling me that somebody mm. from the other side of the table as it were uh, yeah. someone from the yeah. eu did a book in response to it um i haven't mm. read it myself but he was saying it was an intriguing read it's really dry it's really really mm. dry um but um it does give you a different perspective um, um i hope it's hope it's who i think it is and that's wolfgang schuegler 
I forget who it is. I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure, but um, yeah, there is there is a different uh, there, there is another book about that as well. Also, Yanis Varoufakis did um, an interview with the Guardian about two weeks ago. There was a, a pod. They, they do a new daily podcast called Today in Focus. Uh, I'm not sure if All the right. episode is still up online, but there was uh, an interview he did with them about going through the negotiations with Greece and how you can relate it directly to Theresa May um, and the, the things um, that May will be experiencing um, through the EU negotiations or will have been experiencing through the EU negotiations and how they spin things from their side of the table and how it feels when you're sat on the other side of the table. So it was it was uh, an interesting lesson, for sure. Mm. Oh, dude, yeah. Uh, there are a bunch of assholes, absolute, absolute bunch of assholes. And of course, the other thing is, is they had, um, they obviously had like loads of resources when negotiating. They had loads of resources, and so they had the entire uh, propaganda factor of the press on their side the entire time. Uh, and they were, you know, they're having pro- private conversations and then uh, leaking loads of shit to the press, saying that um, how crap, you know, Yanis was, and uh, how he's dragging his feet, being useless, he's being amateurish, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think the guy's a genius, actually. To be honest, I mean, he's he's a very, but very smart human. To yeah. kind of counter your point a little bit, um, mm. the Yanis himself pointed out that May does have similar resources to the EU as far as access to the press goes, mm. and sure, May is sure. May is going through the same thing that Yanis went through as far as the press is concerned. Mm. So it's not. Um, necessarily a lack of resources issue. It's about a press framing issue. Um, sure. Because May, you can't say that May doesn't have access to the machine because she really does. It's not. Oh, sure. Know. It was. It was. It was. It was. <coughs> wasn't kind of the uh, the point I was I was talking about. Oh no no no. But what I'm what I'm saying is this me. is an EU strategy. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. It's not necessarily a, a, a thing against Varoufakis because Varoufakis it is an EU yeah, strategy. Yeah. Sure. Mm, mm. Excellent. So uh, let's see, we've got in the side chat. We've got uh, Jimbo Jones. Hi, Jimbo. Um, Onyx on it. Onst. On, on, on. Somebody want to help me with this? <laughs> I can't see the side. Uh, I don't know. I think that's Onyx uh, on. Oh, oh. Onyx on. Onyx on. Uh, Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Um, Captain Swiss is here straight over hey. off uh, his last video. Um, so so yeah, uh, welcome everybody. Onyx Onst, that's how it's spelled, mate. Doesn't help, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, nine close enough, close enough. So, uh, this video is I was I, I didn't really want to put review because it's not really a review of the book. No. I mean, um, I mean, well, we can both agree that it's. Um, it is a rather good book. It's um, it comes from uh, George, Orwell, George Orwell's kind of uh, documentary set of books, I would say. Yeah, or documentarian. Yeah. Uh, but we're exploring homage to Catalonia uh, by George Orwell, um, and uh, there's a particular reason why Will's here. I mean, Will, you live in Spain, is that correct? I do indeed. I uh, and. Have be- or- Go for it, go for it. Floor's yours. I was going to say, I've been living in Spain for three years now. Uh, the main thing that brought me here was the art community, but I also work professionally as a tour guide, and so I do a lot of reading of Spanish history, and I've always been captivated by the Spanish Civil War, and which automatically makes much Catalonia my favourite book of Orwell's. Uh, gives an incredible insight from a personal perspective all that time. Hmm. It is a, um, a rather interesting um, kind of period in, in in history, and we don't. It's, it's not something that's really in the national curriculum. So I, I really knew nothing about it, uh, to be honest, um, until until I, I read this book and um, did a bit more research into it. Um, well, my first exposure but... to the to the Civil War was actually a documentary that I, I don't know if the BBC did it first, but it was I, I saw it on PBS America. Uh, mm. And it was about the Scottish um, socialist and communist uh, groups that decided to join the fight in in Spain um, as part of the sort of broad mm. coalition. Um, mm. 
Mm. That was my first exposure to it. And that was only what I only saw that about a year ago or so. Uh, like it was something I knew mm. sort of vaguely about, but it never really entered my consciousness until I saw that. And it was only because I stumbled across it in the first place. Mm. Mm. And of course, it's um, there's uh, quite an interesting uh, part. I've put a link to this um, to this essay um, when he uh, after this was in in the early forties. So after he's come back from after George Orwell's come back from um, Catalonia, and um, he's uh, actually I'm going to do this bit after we we talk about the actual book. Actually, get. Okay. Uh, Rather than doing last things first and first things last. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> uh, well, what was your uh, first impressions on the book, first of all? Well, I went into this because all of the recommendations I had seen in the past of homage to Catalonia was, surprise, surprise, anarchists. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. they got a little bit of a hard-on for revolutionary Catalonia. They're saying, oh, yeah, <laughs> homage to Catalonia, great book, Gorwell described the great. So I was going into it expecting... Or well to be romanticizing it from the start. Actually, it's the opposite. He is very scathing initially of the militias uh, who fought against Franco at that time, um, and of kind of the lack of unity between the CNT, uh, standing for the National Workers Confederation, um, who were kind of one of the, the a main trade union, a chief organizer in Catalonia, kind of their refusal to get involved with the central Republican government and kind of vice versa, the um, lack of trust that the uh, Republicans had for the anarchists in turn. And it was kind of that disunity, which played a major part in their downfall, never mind the fact that they had a terrible supply of weapons um, and anti-militarism that really led to poor organisation in the trenches in Aragon and other things. So Orwell really lays into them. But as the book goes on, he kind of slowed, slows down a bit and, there's, and then says, oh, but don't take what I'm saying as an outright condemnation. Actually, it was through this experience that I really saw that there were many positive experiences that I could really see what socialism can be. He kind of describes how there was no noticeable greed amongst the people he was fighting with. There was no concept of hierarchy. Hierarchy. Nobody looked down on the other. And so he kind mm. of saw this proto-socialist society amongst them. So and that's if there was a very positive read in that. And I find mm. him to be a very reliable source. He also says as well, beware of my perspective. Obviously, I have my own biases and I can't be 100% relied upon. Mm -hmm. So it's a balanced, balanced um, commentary he gives, along with acknowledging his own flaws. Uh, that it, That's what really makes the book a great read. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's... Uh, the, in the, uh, the the first uh, couple of introductory uh, chapters, you know, when you, you, you're talking about, you know, uh, revolutionary Catalonia, uh, exactly the same, and he, and he talks about, you know, um, some of the bourgeois actually uh, dressing up in old workmen's uh, uniforms and stuff when they go out uh, so they don't look too out of place. And uh, be careful to watch their languages and their accents and then the way that they address people, you know, not to use, uh, not to look Stead. down on people like he's saying. Which, yeah. And uh, using kind of uh, honorific uh, language, um, and it's it's quite a a, a mirror, isn't it? Because he, he didn't actually spend that long on the front, did he? No, um, he didn't. He was overall, just there for the winter of thirty six. Yeah. yeah, so I, only only a few months. Um, uh, I don't know. Is it? I mean, the 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 book was released in in. Uh, you know, quite a long time ago. I, I mean, spoilers. Like, <laughs> it's, yeah, is there not? such a thing it's, for it's a book? Not like it's, it's not like it's a novel full of twists and turns. Like, we all know how the Civil War ended. So, spoiler yeah, alert, Frank. Yeah, no I mean, sorry. <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, he's actually uh, uh, shot. And when he obviously is in hospital and recovery, and then when he comes out of hospital, goes back to Barcelona, and it's how kind of mad how how, how that almost the um, the hierarchy had come back in just the space of a few months, you know. And yes, when the uh, popular army the... came in and took over. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, another thing that 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 uh, that struck me uh, was was the real um, kind of. Uh, how he does it day by day, almost like a diary, 
you know, mm-hmm. um, which is very similar to Down and Out in Paris and London, uh, where yeah. he does it in almost a day by day kind of thing. And he, he, he talks about everything from the, uh, you know, how much tobacco there is, how much uh, coffee there is, what they're doing, you know, on a, on a day by day, um, his complete lack of shooting skills. Uh, which is quite quite uh, entertaining, you know. Oh, yeah. shot at someone today, missed. Oh yeah, that's again. True. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> or how um they um, yeah when they when it gets onto that sort of lack of lack of training amongst the others and um, mm. lack of supply. And there's a point where uh you know he's, he's describing how you're, they would have received like ten guns for a company of thirty men, and the only good gun went to the quote unquote manicon. Which means Nancy boy, mm. like uh, why are they giving the good yeah. guns that experienced little teenager? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that was, I mean that's uh, something he addresses in his um, in his essay. You know, it's uh, just the complete lack of material, the uh, complete lack of um, discipline within the troops. Because you know you're looking at uh, an anarchist, uh, like almost horizontal society. And obviously, but within a within a militaristic kind of setting, you need some kind of hierarchy there. So you know, because everybody needs to do a job, and it'd be like, it's your turn to go on guard. Yeah, but why should I? Because it's your turn. <laughs> but you're not my boss. Nobody's my boss. Oh, please. <laughs> and a lot please, of these, it's your time. And a, yeah, and a lot of these people were just kids who thought they were, you know, going along on an adventure like with their scout troop. Yeah. Yeah. He does say as well, so, though, it's like how I said, how he'll kind of midway through the book say, oh, don't take this as a condemnation. He, he kind of also points out that the whole time at least he was on service there, there were only two known desertions, and, or no, three known desertions, two of which were suspected to have been uh, people defecting to the nationalists anyway. So he kind of remarks hmm. that in spite of the lack of discipline, while, while say, under a conventional army, a desertion would have been far more common. They mm. still at least believed in the cause enough to stay and fight. Mm. I guess my question would be at this point, if there was more discipline, if there was a hierarchy as such, um, mm. do you think that despite the lack of training, they would have actually gotten somewhere? Because I I suspect that some of the failings of the armies at that time were because there were so many sort of fractured ideas it wasn't quite a a unified force indeed i dif- that's difficult to say mm. because as i said before it wasn't just down to lack of unity and discipline it was an it was a woeful supply of arms sure uh, and even if they did have all of that it it's kind of impossible to say whether or not they would have stood up to Frank. Well, more what I'm saying is, but... if they had a hierarchy, would they have been able to manage the scant supplies better? Do you get what I'm saying? Well, he, yeah. here we go. Um, <clears throat> here's here's an interesting uh, sentence from uh, the essay. Um, so, the much publicised disunity on the government side was not a main cause of defeat. Uh, the government militias were hurriedly raised, ill-armed, and unimaginatively in their un unimaginative in their military outlook, but it would have been the same if if complete political agreement had existed from the start. So um, there you go. There's a um, snippet of what he, what he writes in. in yeah, something else to point out, actually. Based on other stuff I've read, if it wasn't for those self-organised militias, the war would have been over within the night. You see, right from the beginning, um, this was meant to be a military coup on the part of the nationalists that uh, would have taken over very swiftly. Mm. Uh, Franco and General Muller, actually, never mind Franco, it was Muller who was leading this revolt uh, based in Pamplona in the north. What they were kind of counting on was that if news that Franco was flying over from Morocco with his elite foreign legion, then all soldiers loyal to them in every major city would immediately march out of their barracks and take over the councils. Thing is, it was the unions and other sorts of civilian society, um, civilians organizations who mm. knew already that this was coming. They knew the political climate. So they appealed to the central government in Madrid saying, please arm us. 
and the central government, who didn't hadn't by this point still didn't have an army of their own, instead said, "What armed civilians? Do you think we're stupid? No." So instead, the civilians ran straight to the barracks, um, raided them, took the weapons for themselves, and crushed um, any attempt of the nationalists, soldiers, loyalists to take over. This was successful in Barcelona, Valencia, and Madrid. So this was really that was really what gave the Republic a fighting chance. Orwell himself said too that while it was the uh, popular army, as in the official Republican government army, training uh, behind the lines, it was the civilians militias at the front uh, kind of holding the line mm. more, more what I was getting at before it wasn't necessarily to say that the, the, the civilian militias were the problem more mm. what I was aiming at was if you'd had once once it had been established that the civilian militias are going to be involved <clears throat> if you could have established um, a ranking order a, a, a proper hierarchy in, in a militaristic sense um, not necessarily in a, a day by day sense. Yes, um, I totally get that. That that's that's what I was getting at. Not necessarily um, that the the civilian militia shouldn't have been involved. That's not that wasn't my point. No, no, not at all. Um, <clears throat> but so, yeah, I think it was. I think if anything else, that self organization and lack of hierarchy that actually at the, at least at the start saved them. Yeah, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of course. Um... I suppose when you're looking at uh, a militia that they're, they're um, you know, they're uh, anarchists, uh, socialists, and it, uh, like they, like you say, it was a, a kind of uh, a, a mix of of people with different ideolo- ideologies, but most of them were all horizontalists. And you know, mm. and to say, oh, you know, what's what's the point in fighting with a with an army with a with a hierarchy? We, we're we're fighting the fascists to get away from hierarchy. Mm. You know, but the then you do point, have so... the anarchists and the communists who would often disagree with each other, and you'd often get a lot of uh, mm. issues with those groups internally. And that that's that's the issue I I think that I think go, gets missed because I remember the, the documentary I watched um, the the Scottish communists that went there. Um, they used to get a lot of bother uh, and even um, friend on friend fire from mm. the anarchist groups. So that I think is a contributing factor to a degree, not not an overall mm. issue, but it's mm. a contributing factor to to you know these groups kind of splintering and inefficient use of arms and the rest of it. Mm. Mm. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, um, all right, moving on from from that when he's talking about uh, trench warfare and, and like I said you, you get a running kind of commentary on, on how much tobacco there is in circulation at any one time how much coffee there is in circulation at any one time you know uh, once the winter started to uh, end and they're all always wet always cold always miserable always mm. grumpy you know and um, which <laughs> absolutely I'm not surprised to be honest no. um, uh, he's um I completely forgot what I was going to going through now. Um, it's trench warfare. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in the winter. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And and it's and it's these little things, uh, especially when spring started coming. He, he starts talking about the lice that are uh, that are nesting in in his crotch and things like that. And it's yeah. honestly, it's it really, really grim, really grim, you know. And um, yeah, just yeah, it's it's nasty. Nasty, nasty stuff, and you, you'd think that we would have gone, or at least uh, Spain would have been beyond that, you know, because you know, yeah, when, when you think about um trench warfare, you think of something that's pre 1920s, really, don't you? Yeah, World War One, you think yeah. World War One, yeah, yeah, exactly. This was so, also, yeah, it's, in it's, a way, a war that was a test for that transition into what would have been considered more modern warfare. And um, the in fact, the first ever airstrikes by by planes was during the Spanish Civil War. That was essentially a mm. test for the Nazis of their Luftwaffe. Mm, mm. Indeed. Indeed. Okay, so um, moving on then, and um, and the comparisons we can draw um, to today. Uh, something that was written in, in the 1940s by, or- by Orwell and about the uh, Spanish War, and this is this, I think, is is probably one of the most interesting uh, snippets from uh, his, his essays when he talks about um, 
well, I'll read it to you and then you can you can comment on it. Uh, he says, the most baffling thing in the Spanish war was the behavior of the great powers. The war was actually won for Franco by the Germans and Italians, whose motives were obvious enough. The motives of France and Britain are less easy to understand. In 1936, it was clear to everyone that if Britain would only help the Spanish government, even to the extent of a few million pounds worth of arms, Franco would collapse and German strategy would be severely dislocated. That, I think, is key, especially with regards to what we know now about the Second World War. Mm. Uh, by that time, one did not need to be a clairvoyant to foresee uh, that war between Britain and Germany was coming. One could even foretell within a year or two when it would come. Yet in the most mean, cowardly, hypocritical way, the British ruling classes did all they could to hand Spanish over to Franco and the Nazis. Why? Because they were pro-fascist, was the obvious answer. Undoubtedly, they were. And yet when it came to the final showdown, they choose to stand up to Germany. It is still very uncertain what plan, uh, what plan they acted on backing Franco. And they may have had no clear plan at all. Whether the British ruling class are wicked or merely stupid is one of the most difficult questions of our time. And at certain moments, a very important question. So now, I, I sometimes think about this. Uh, sorry, I, I sometimes think about this um, when I look at, uh, you know, Greece and the Golden Dawn and the rise of, of the far right uh, throughout yeah, uh, Europe uh, and just through um, the use of uh, austerity and, and how they're just getting stronger and stronger. And whenever I, whenever I think about that, I always think about that, that one portion of the paragraph that Orwell wrote in the 1940s. So my response to that mm -hmm. is it's incredibly simplistic. Because it ignores a few things. One, dude, dude, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah. First thing is right. That is that is a uh, one snippet, right? Of um, uh, like eight paragraphs. I understand um, that. I understand like, that. But you brought it. You brought it to everyone's attention. So I'm responding to it. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, um, sure, sure. Right. A few, a few key things that I think have been, well, at least in the passage you read out, were missed off. So okay. The the. The British were quite heavily affected by the Great Depression. This was 1936. Mm -hmm. So the British yeah. were still in the process of rebuilding themselves from, from sure. the economic collapse of the Great Depression. The other mm -hmm. thing is, why do you think that Chamberlain appeased Hitler in 30, uh, 37, 38, 39? Because he was anti-communist. No, mm. because we did not have the resources militarily at the time to go mm -hmm. to war with Germany. Mm -hmm. um, sure. It's nowhere near as simple as, oh, anti-communist equals um, endorse Hitler. No, we just, we could not get involved in a fight with a country which had, which basically would have outclassed us at the time in air warfare. There's just no way we could have done it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So if we had given money or arms to the Spanish, it would have prevented Spain from falling to Franco, fine. But mm. what would have been the consequences further down the line when it came to World War, uh, World War II? Bear in mind, mm. when we actually did start winning in World War II, it was by the thinnest of margins. And it was only sure, because sure, Hitler sure. made mistakes. It wasn't because we actually did much right, in all seriousness. Mm. Um, Hitler sure. overextended himself into Russia. Sure. So yeah, yeah. if if the British had committed millions of pounds to Spain and arms to Spain, it's actually quite feasible we could have lost World War Two. So it's an I don't interesting think thought it's quite, though, I, isn't it? Oh sure, but I think I, I know you I, I think it's incredibly simplistic. Oh, oh, indeed, indeed, and I, and I would say if if you're interested, you know, I I did put a link to the essay sure, I'll, in I'll the have a read description. It later. I just I, I think based on just oh, Britain endorses or supports fascism. That's no, I don't buy that at all, not for a second. I think Britain was anti-communist. Fine, that's that's entirely fair. Hmm. But to say that we didn't intervene because anti-communist. Seems yeah, but you no, 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 no. But you're you're also uh, missing a, a key point that uh, ruling classes. Um, so you know, this... you cannot you cannot view every decision based on ideology. That just doesn't work. It's just well, of course, impossible. of course. So of course, this sort of, of 
everything cannot always come back to that. Unfortunately, it might be convenient sometimes to think that way, but you cannot always do that. Sometimes, sometimes there are actually practical reasons why things can't happen. As opposed I agree. to ideological ones. Hmm. I agree. I just think it's uh, it's it's interesting to think about. It's an interesting one you to know? think about, but I just think that like jumping to the conclusion that bourgeois want to crush the the little guy is always it, it it's it's nice and convenient and nice and simple. It just it, it ignores too much. Uh, the backbone of uh, of the resistance against Franco was the Spanish working class, especially the urban trade union members. In the long run, and it's important to remember that. I, uh, that this is only the long run. The working class re remains the most reliable enemy of fascism, simply because the working class stands to gain most by a decent reconstruction of society. Unlike other classes or categories, it can't be personally bribed, which is quite uh, interesting as well. Yes, the start um, of the war yeah. was... I was just going to say, the start of the war was uh, an opportunity for revolution in that sense. Uh, it's also important to talk about the context of the years leading up, where Spain had become a republic mm. in 1931, um, but they were they were central they were centre left governments all the way through. They promised land reform because Spain, up until that point, had been pretty much a feudalist country. So they wanted a kind of slow policy of reform to redistribute the lands. The trouble was that the workers on those lands were starving, uneducated, barely in a position to wait for that. So by 36, in that election where the Popular Front won, um, and then suddenly there was a threat of war, it was kind of a chance for, at least as the farmers and the factory workers saw it, was to turf out the owners who probably who were siding with Franco and take control of the land themselves. So they, that was an opportunity for them, basically. Hmm. so how do you think um and now obviously um where uh spain is in a in a post franco um kind of uh, situation post franco uh, country and i saw in the news a couple of days ago that the uh, fascists in spain want to turn franco into a saint which is yeah. uh quite interesting i mean how is all that going down in in spain so that's uh, what you just mentioned there that's a reaction to the fact that the government wants to uh first of all exhume franco's body they've also just passed a vote where for the first time officially the state has officially condemned the franco dictatorship uh which Ooh. passed with basically the obviously the left-wing majority voting for and then everyone else just abstaining and kind of refusing to take a stance on it uh, interestingly, the, the, this has only recently happened now because ever since 2010, 2011, in government were the PP or the People's Party, you would call it in English. They were, in fact, founded by the former ministers of Franco. And so it's always been in their interests not to not to show their outright support for Franco, because even that would be political suicide for them, but to straight up say, that was in the past, why are we focusing on this now? We have nothing to do with this. In fact, with that vote that just passed, one of the senators of the PP said, yes, of course we condemn the Franco regime, but I was born 11 years after the end of that, so what's that got to do with me? The answer is your <laughs> political party is associated with them. Uh, so there's finally this change happening where they're kind of trying to shift the zeitgeist where they can actually, for the first time ever since the end of the dictatorship, talk openly about the negative effects that he has had on Spain posthumously. People constantly talk about the ghost of Franco and how it yes. still looms over the country. Well, that and, and the ghost of the Civil War, let alone Franco himself. Yes, that the, too. You, you very rarely hear any mention. Like when I went to uh, southern Spain, um, they were very, very keen to talk about history, uh, even going back to the, the times when southern Spain was was Arab, um, mm. essentially. It, it was an Islamic, uh, it was part of the Islamic uh, order at the time. Um, they, they're really happy to talk about things like that. But you mentioned Franco, you mentioned the second, you, you mentioned the, the, the civil war, anything like that. Oh, hush, hush, hush. We don't talk about that right now. Mm. It's like, why? Oh, because, because it's too sore for people. 
Yeah, I just can imagine the younger Spanish generations are somewhat peeved about that. Mm. They've uh, many of my friends have explained to me how when they're at school, the history syllabus was purposefully extended so that by the time you got to the 1930s, conveniently the term was over and there was no time to cover it. Ooh, interesting. It would be like in this country, just not talking about the Second World War. It would be mm -hmm. crazy. <laughs> mm. So mm. many people like who are against the whole condemnation of Franco and Exuma's body, saying it's going too far. Why are we doing this now? You're only opening up old wounds. I think the way actually the people who are pro condemnation of Franco officially now are saying the wounds were never healed. They they've always just had plasters slapped over or scratching at the scabs if you really want to go deep into that metaphor but the only way you really can heal it properly is to actually properly discuss it and mm. oh i don't know give proper burials to all the people in mass graves who are killed by the dictatorship oh dear. yeah yeah that's um yeah mm. Well, one um, of the concerns so... about Franco as well is they, they're talking about uh, exhuming his remains. Mm -hmm. um, and Franco's family managed to, correct me if I'm wrong here, they managed to get um, a, a judgment essentially to have him buried in the crypt in the cathedral in, in, in Madrid. Which... Indeed, this is what they are requesting. Mm. Um, they're citing a law passed back in 2010 that would actually permit not only for him to be buried there, but with a state funeral with military honours. <laughs> Can you imagine the yeah. disaster of that? Well, the, the, there's <laughs> that, and there's also the situation where you do still have some fascists in Spain who go to Franco's current burial site and treat him as a martyr, essentially, don't they? They, they, they almost worship him. It's kind of sick mm. and weird. Um, yeah. But the, the concern with that, obviously, is that you end up moving that to the, the main cathedral in Madrid. Um, Indeed, the, yeah. anniversary of his, the anniversary of his death was just last Sunday, every year. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. That came from nowhere. On the anniversary of his death every year, yes, you have people marching by the Valley of the Fallen, full-on goose-stepping, dictatorship flag-waving, fascist salutes galore. They do the same by the Royal Theatre in Madrid, which is just opposite the Royal Palace, where Franco used to address the nation from the balcony. They gather there for a little ceremony as well. So, it's, yeah, indeed, to move all of that down right to the dead centre of Madrid, never mind people turning up for a pilgrimage, you would also have people from the other side running in and vandalising the crypt and starting mm -hmm. fights. It would be a nightmare. And bear in mind, that's a major tourist hotspot there, isn't it? It is. That cathedral. And that's the last thing that Spain wants to be known for, isn't it? No. <laughs> So, so this um, is a how... kind of un unresolvable, currently unresolvable. I think Pedro Sanchez, I'm not the biggest fan of him, but he's been kind of working working across with other other organizations involved. Like he went to visit the Vatican to try and get the Pope to intervene because obviously these Properties that Franco is buried and they're proposing move into, to move into are owned by the Catholic Church. Uh -huh. So the jury's still out on that, whether he would actually be buried in the cathedral or not by now. What so, you um, say, uh, yeah, I was just going to ask you a question, really, about um, about the fascist or right wing, uh, far right uh, wing movements in, in Spain as it stands now, I mean, um, is it is it growing? Is it on the wane? Is it getting stronger? Is it getting more political power? Um, what's what's the, the, the story now? Politically, their, rep um, their representation is very small, uh, certainly in the Congress and the Senate. Uh, the the PP were voted, ousted with votes of no confidence back at the end of, um, back around April, May time. And that was largely down to numerous accounts of corruption that have been coming out against them for years now. There's a whole Wikipedia page just on corruption of the, of the Partido Popular. So with their ousting, um, replacing them was Pizzoe. Um Officially, they're called the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party, but that's just because that was the name they were founded under in the 19th century. After the 1978 democratic constitution, they kind of shed, a, shed their Marxist principles and are now center-left social democrats 
the way they're able to govern now is with a confidence and supply de uh, deal from Podemos, who are the anti-austerity, anti-corruption, pro-union wing of Spain. So they're kind of the option for left-wingers. Um, and then the only other party on the right other than the PP is Ciudadanos, who are more centre-right neoliberals. So if you're a Francoist or a fascist, then you're not going to go for either of them. There is one political party now, a, a right-wing populist party called Vox. They've been around around the same time as Podemos since 2014. They are looking to gain a bit more popularity now. They've been having rallies all the way through this year, but nowhere near as on the same scale as, say, AFD in Germany or the, the Northern League of Italy. It's pre been predicted they'll probably get about one seat in the 2020 election coming up. I think the concerning thing with Vox, though, is so with the migrant crisis in Italy, which has basically fallen out of the fallen out of the headlines lately, because Italy have taken such a firm line against immigration, um, basically most of the immigration into Italy has actually stopped, mm. um, and a lot of it's now moved over to Spain's southern coast. Um, it, it's nowhere near the numbers it was to Italy because it's a much more difficult route for them to get there. But there are migrants coming into southern Spain now, if, if I'm correct. That and the uh, the Spanish enclave on the north of Africa, near Morocco. Mm -hmm. um, and so from my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Will, but my understanding is that Vox are basically capitalising on this and saying, look what's happened elsewhere in Europe. This is happening here. Um, and so they've seen a little bit of a surge, not much of one, but mm -hmm. it's enough that it's having people raising their eyebrows and being a bit concerned. You're correct there. Um, this is why I said that this year they've seen a slight, slightly more inc more of an increase in popularity. Mm -hmm. The thing is, uh, Spain, it's, I'm surprised this doesn't get reported on much, but Spain comparatively has done actually very well uh, with housing immigrants compared to the rest mm -hmm. of Europe. This doesn't go across the boards. They've got a massive issue, for instance, with undocumented workers down in the farms of Andalusia. These are the, and, Mur and Murcia as well. These are the largest farms in all of Europe. A lot of um, fruit and veg exported goes to Northern Europe. And the majority of workers down there are un undocumented, paid pitiful wages and live in shanty towns. On the other hand, in bigger cities like Madrid, Barcelona, um, there are a lot of specifically refugee organisations who have made sure that um, at least those who apply for asylum actually get it, are actually integrated into the community, given Spanish lessons, uh, given jobs. There are certain grassroots efforts in different neighbourhoods to just host, you know, get fiestas, gatherings, that uh, cooking sessions hosted by the refugees themselves. And so if you go to the big cities, there's less sway towards Vox for that reason. Certainly out in the countryside, I would see that as a concern. Um, Andalusia is the one that everyone's concerned about, isn't it? Because yes, that's basically Andalusia where most of them are is, coming in. Yes, and it's given that it's the most, easily the most impoverished region yes. in the whole country. It's very easy to blame their problems on yeah, immigration for that. Um, what I had somewhere I was going and I've forgotten it now. I was like halfway through formulating it and it's just gone <laughs> sorry I, I should also say um, so in, in terms of right wingers in Spain there's also I can't really give you any outright uh, contemporary evidence for this but I would treat certain members of the military and the Guardia Civil with suspicion as well mm. uh, ever since the 1978 since the 1978 constitution when there was kind of a restructuring of the military they began to separate the ties between the Guardia Civil and the Department of Defence. The Guardia Civil themselves are police charged with military duties. They have control over the, most of the countryside and they guard civic buildings in the and city. And they're basically the federal police, as we would know. Yes. Uh, we would know it, yeah. And since uh, in the, at the start of the 80s, they actually attempted a coup on the government. They invaded the uh, Congress opened fire and chased all of the deputies out and uh, staged an occupation demanding a return to dictatorship. 
There have been massive rallies in Barcelona over this as well, haven't there? Because there's, yes. because the the Guardia Civil have um, been protesting for better pay. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in Barcelona. But they were the ones who always sent in to crush the uh, referendum demonstration. Yes, lot. and so you've basically got this sort of weird situation where you've got people protesting for better pay being countered by protesters basically shouting, we hate you because you killed our referendum. Um, yes. it's, it's farcical. The whole thing is just a mess. So um, going going back to uh, that referendum, so uh, Catalonia wanted to be an independent state. Um, the Spanish government viewed it as an illegal referendum, so uh, sent in the jackboots and and took away all the voting boxes. Right, uh, mm-hmm. that's that's the long and the short of it. But it is important to remember that constitutionally it was actually illegal. It's not that yes, they were just yes, saying it was illegal because they didn't like it. Constitutionally, mm-hmm. it was illegal. Was so, he was illegal, yeah. Yeah. This actually goes right. a little bit even a little bit further back than that, because the last time Pizzoia was in government, this was going up to 2010, they had made they had made a deal with Catalonia that would have granted more autonomy to the region. I believe mm-hmm. that's how it went. It wouldn't have granted them full independence, but it uh, would have given them a lot more autonomy that they desired. Just before they were about to sign that through. They got voted out by the PP, who then went to the Supreme Court and had all of that scrapped. Yeah. So he showed outright contempt for them. And so in response, that's kind of what triggered the modern independence movement. Yeah. And bear in mind, the referendum, the last referendum took place when whilst PP was still in, in charge. Yes. Um, Prozoe are back in charge now, but they're... The, the, from, Outside Spain, it looks like they're reluctant to go quite as far as they used to go. I don't they know are. if that's true. They are. Before Sanchez came in as PM, uh, Rajoy had repealed their autonomy and imposed direct rule over them. And mm. in fact, last December, he actually restaged a an election there to try and kind of reset everything. And while Ciudad Danos, <laughs> who yes, and what yeah, exactly. While Ciudad while Ciud Danos, who are the anti, who the whole reason they were set up as a party was they think they are the Catalan party who are against <laughs> Catalan independence. They did gain a few more seats in Parliament, but more or less it stayed the same. Uh, but at the same time, the deputies still stayed in jail. Carlos Puigdemont can take up his seat because he is in exile, still is in exile. Yeah. Uh, so now Kim Torra, who's more of an in betweener, is president. But again, once um, the vote of no confidence happened in Rajoy and his government, Sanchez took over, immediately repealed direct rule, hoping that by giving them back autonomy and you know, promising more leniency that this would make the independence movement back down. And it hasn't. Because Puigdemont is still in exile and people are still in prison. Yes, and the, coup, and the coup, who are the even more hardcore independentists are saying, we're going to take this, um, yeah, we're going to take ourselves out of Spain with or without your go-ahead. Mm-hmm. But Which is one I of the know. key reasons why if Scotland ever tried for independence and wanted to join the EU, um, Spain they would, would not veto it. it indeed. Because Spain would veto it. So, uh, yeah, this is... <laughs> <laughs> what a fucking mess <laughs> it is, it's terrible the worst thing um, as well I, it kind of pisses me off as well when people kind of do play it up as oh good um, liberal independent minded Catalonia versus big bad Spanish government this whole independence movement has been largely fuelled by again centre right neoliberals of the Catalan government Puigdemont mm. was by no means a freedom fighter he and all of his arrested, most of his erected deputies all have bank accounts in Andorra. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, I mean, it's the same just... as the SNP in Scotland. It's almost a, it's a perfect parallel. Exactly they, the same. They claim to be lefty. They claim to be freedom fighters, all the rest of it. They're not. If you look at their policies, they're basically neoliberal. Mm. <laughs> it, it's almost a direct parallel. Which is why the I, I always call the story of the modern Catalan independence movement just this nonsensical game of chicken between mm. Piedmont and Rajoy. Which Neither Rajoy of them refusing what, to jump basically. off the road. Yeah. yeah. There were so, a lot of good memes um, out of it. I'll give it that, though. <laughs> so, um, 
when it comes to the um, the anarchist movement and the um, uh, the left movement within uh, Spain and, and Catalonia, um, do you think what's happened uh, recently has made them stronger, or, or do you think they're still a bit battered and bruised? Battered and bruised, without a doubt, because they're just they're just not sadly they just aren't enough for them. If we're talking anarchists supporting independence, there's just not enough of them. Um, polls showed leading up to that referendum that 70% of the Catalan people uh, were against it. They consider themselves, while they could still have a strong sense of their own individual culture, the same goes for every region of Spain. Every region of Spain has a strong sense of individuality. Yes. But ask anyone, and for the most part, they will say, I am Spanish first and I am this other region second. Mm. I mean, mm. Catalonia is not even the only one with its own language, is it? Like, there's plenty oh, of regions yeah. in Spain with different dialects and different languages altogether. Uh, mm-hmm. Because everyone always tries to say, oh, because Catalonia speaks Catalan, surely it's it's different to the rest of... No, most of the rest of Spain have its own languages as well. Yeah, the Basque Country have an even stronger claim to their separate heritage. In the G- G- Galicia as well. And there's a yeah, Galicia ones. as well. The Canaries and the Balearics have their own... In fact, the Canaries have more in common with the Caribbean than they do in Spain. And Andalusia has mm. a small, weird thing going on as well. <laughs> yeah, they just speak yeah. in weird abbreviations. Yeah. So it, it's mm. not an exclusive thing to, Cat, uh, to Catalonia, but Catalonia have been the most successful in pushing for it, I suppose. Yes, if you, if you do want to talk about a legitimate cause for the left in Spain, then it kind of comes from the municipalist movement. The way they've kind of been, the way they've all this time been able to undermine austerity, at least when that's the program as it was under the PP, uh, is through rather than running mainstream parties, Podemos have created an alliance called Unidos Podemos, which is basically a coalition with them and all of the regional parties and even some smaller town parties. In the case of Madrid, that's Ahorra Madrid, whose mayor, Manuela Carmena, is tied to Podemos. And it's all been through. Um, the indig- uh, sorry, I've been letting my mind wander while saying this. My thoughts. Um, it, go- it goes back to just after the financial crisis, the initial rollout of austerity, with these movements, uh, save stopping, stopping unlawful evictions, for instance, stopping the repossession of people's homes by the banks. They kind of, on the small scale, uh, kind of avoided a lot of homelessness and drawn up this list of grievances by that, and then taken it directly to the government. Government from the ground up, Callum Ferguson mm-hmm. will be proud. Indeed. <laughs> I keep saying to Callum, actually, that Spain is come some, could come somewhere close to his idea of the of his treaties. Boss him up, yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, so it should be. It should always be from the bottom up, not the top down. But, um, but yeah, and any... Um, we're reaching the last five minutes now, so uh, any, any uh, final uh, questions there, Matt? Um, I've got nothing. Has anyone in the comments got actually got any questions? Because we've, we've oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, the ruling classes were responsible. This is from G. Uh, the ruling classes were responsible <laughs> for the first and second world war. I'm not sure how that's not re- relevant. Um, that's when I was talking. Oh, that about was that the... was in response to my rant at you. <laughs> <I think. laughs> uh, yeah, um, and, and again, I, I just want to add that 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 that, um, that this essay that was I've been reading mm. from was written in uh, 1942 or 1943, and obviously what you're talking about is with 2020 hindsight. So sure, and 42 you know, was when we uh, looked like we were losing as well. To be fair, mm. so um, I mean, you know, it, again, context is important, but at the same time, it's it's important to to think about these things with a clear head rather than through the lens of ideology. That's all. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, <laughs> uh, this this thim, uh, says, um, that, okay, said they're uh, both wicked and stupid with regards to the UK ruling class. I can't disagree with that, um, because they tend to be. Um, uh, Jimbo Jones says he just bought the book on Audible for two pound fifty. Just also good on you, Jimbo. Yeah, it's a, it is a great, it is a great read. Um, Adam West pops in and says, uh, "EU passing Internet Law 31. Uh, God, that's oh, a discussion. No. Oh, that's yeah. Um... But isn't that 
isn't that going to be ratified in January? So it's not passed yet, as far as I'm aware. Although they've they've probably voted on anyway. That's a discussion for another day. Mm. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Um, yeah. 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 It's 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 messy. It's messy. Um, G Wishes says in response. Oh, sorry, Jimbo Jones says uh, S and P are not left wing. That argument suits union sensibilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, not well. Obviously, not the way that they're fucking over the teachers at the moment. Um, teachers are just about to go on strike in uh, Scotland, from what I can well, because tell the SNP. The, the reason I mentioned the, the left wing thing, the SNP do a very good job in England of mm. projecting themselves as a sort of left wing ally of Labour, um, at least in the Commons. And it's mm. it's a trick I've fallen for, and many others I know have fallen for in the past. And then you actually look into how they're their party itself is run and you look into what they're doing in Scotland as far as domestic politics up there go, because we don't hear about it in England. This is something a lot of Scottish people forget about. We don't hear about what goes on in Scotland up there, uh, down here. It's, it's just not in the news. And so mm. it, it's one of those things where like you, you always hear, Oh, Labour could go into coalition with the SNP. Oh no, that would be bloody awful. Don't do that. <laughs> It'd be absolutely atrocious. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally. Uh, G. Wiss has come back and says, what ideology? There are people in power and then people are, who aren't. Um, I think uh, this comes back to uh, when I said to Matt that um, a lot of the ruling class in uh, the UK were uh, pro-Nazi uh, because... Pro-fascist, they said, yeah. Were both, uh, pro-fascist because they were both anti-communists um, and they could see, uh, or anti-red, as Orwell puts it. Mm. Um, but again, like I said, this is this is this this is of the time. Uh, but it's, whereas it's, uh, the, the other uh, thing that's worth remembering is it. it's entirely possible to be anti-communist and anti-fascist. To say that because somebody is anti-communist sure. that they're pro-fascist is mm-hmm. it's missing the mark a bit. I mean, don't forget uh, Europe at the time. It was a, it, it's very similar to now, except it was more mili- uh, more militaristic than now. In the um, it was a shift to either side of the spectrum hard. Uh, it wasn't mm. necessarily um, that there wasn't much room left for those of us who consider ourselves to be somewhere in the center. So, um, but to, to not act against fascism is to be pro fascism, but then to okay, not act against communism is to be pro communism by the same, by the same standard. And communism um, at the time, don't no. forget, was Soviet. It wasn't communism as you want it to be. It was Soviet communism. Mm-hmm. We, then you're talking about Stalinism, not communism. We, well, they called it communism. Sorry. Or socialism, as, mm-hmm. as they called it at the time. So mm-hmm. whatever you want to brand it as, that's what they called it. Um, okay. So uh, last couple of minutes. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Before we just go go off on, on some other like <laughs> quite a massive tangent um there don't get me wrong there's a massive discussion in them and we will we will carry That's on so another I'm day more than happy to have it. <laughs> um so i i just want to pass on my thoughts to um harry leslie smith who's currently in icu in canada mm-hmm. uh i hope he he um has a speedy recovery um he's he's had a a life of uh fighting um, for the rights of, of people, building the NHS, uh, destroying the slums, uh, making sure that um, nobody is forgotten in society. And I hope he continues his fight. And of course, um, he comes out uh, the other side uh, fit and fighting. Um, would anybody like to say anything? Just echo your mighty innings. Um, and at the end of his uh, book, Don't Let My Past Be Your Future, he does actually say that uh, since his son died and, and, and whatever and his, and his wife's died, he is pretty much just living out the last of his days. And I've seen there's a lot of bit, been a lot of love um, on, on Twitter and we're getting like hourly updates. Uh, I, I will say the details of those updates is a little bit much. I, I, I'm, I, I understand mm. that they want to keep people updated, but I think some of it is a little bit mm. like, did, did we need to know that? I don't think we needed to yeah, know Yeah, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, but yeah, um, solidarity with, with Harry. Um, so I'm going to close out with uh, another read from uh, this essay. Um, would anybody like to 
um, add anything before we finish? I, I, of course, I want to thank you, uh, Matt, Matt and Will, for thank coming. You, any, any closing um, thoughts? Before you, I'll tell you what, I propose that you read that part of the essay, and I would like to finish the stream with a funny anecdote from the Civil War. So that we can laugh at the Okay. I, I would okay. can I can okay. I plug my podcast <laughs> and be really annoyed. Yes, of course. Oh sorry, plugs, 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 of course. Yeah. Um I do a podcast. We're off this week because it's Thanksgiving week and the co-host is American and so he's doing the family thing. Um but uh we will be back next week. I do a thing called The Game is Rigged, which is an international uh politics and world affairs podcast. Um it's uh, available at tgir.fyi and it's also on Spotify if you want to find it there. It's very Thanks. good. Oh. Everybody listens to it. Will is a big fan. Yep, yep. By all accounts. I'm one of his two fans. <laughs> along with James <laughs> yeah, Will and James Fielding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> excellent. So, uh, one has to remember, uh, one has to remember this to see the Spanish War in its true perspective. When one thinks of cruelty, squalor, and the futility of war, and this, and in this particular case of the intrigues, the persecutions, and the lies and misunderstandings, there is always the temptation to say one side is as bad as the other. I am neutral. In practice, however, one cannot be neutral. And there is hardly such a thing as a war in which makes no difference to who wins. Nearly always one stands more or less for progress. The other side is more or less for reaction. The hatred which the Spanish Republic cited in millions, dukes, cardinals, playboys, blimps, and whatnot would itself be enough to show uh, show one how land lie. In essence, it was a class war. If it had been won, the cause of the common people everywhere would have been strengthened. It was lost. And the dividend drawers all over the world rubbed their hands. That was the real issue. All else was froth on its surface. Thank you. Do you want to uh, fin finish off with your thing? Cool. Yeah, so this is an anecdote from the Spanish Civil War that I feel really sums up all of the pomp and ceremony of fascism. So I mentioned earlier on that the initial coup was led by General Moller and General Franco. There was one other man named José San Jorge, formerly the leader of the Civil Guard, who did in 1932, attempt to lead the Guardia Civil in a rising against the government. It failed miserably, he went under house arrest, and he later escaped and went to live in exile in Portugal. When he learns that the coup was about to begin in 36, though, he bravely ran to a biplane, bringing with him a load of baggage. The idea was that he would go on this covert mission right outside the borders of Madrid and ride in and save the day. When he brought his bags, though, to this small plane, that, uh, though, the pilot said to him, what are you doing with all of that? The plane's going to crash if we put all of that baggage on. Uh, San Jorge responded with, if I am to become the next dictator of Spain, I will do so in the proper attire. So the pilot um, eventually just relented. They tried to fit as much of it as they could on there. They took off over the border of Portugal, bravely into Spain, and then the plane buckled under the weight, fell and crashed. San Jorge died, and the pilot lived to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> all for the sake of well, a, a, a fascist really uniform. All the <laughs> were a fascist uniform when he was, <laughs> when he was taking over. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Everybody, everybody in the side chat and thank you to my uh, panelists um hopefully uh, i'll be doing something in the next week or so but uh, thank you very much good night Ta -ta.